Hello everybody. I hope you've had a good week and you're well. Now, a number of you have contacted me and said, you know what, Mark, I think a really good idea for um, a theme for a future vlog would be the history of the choir. Now, I thought about that and I thought, yeah, you know what, that would be. It would be a good idea. Um, now, being the mere young spring chicken that I am, um, I can't probably remember all that way back, although I seem to have been with the choir for quite a while now. So what I've done is I've enlisted the help of a few friends uh, for next week's vlog, because next week will be the history of our choir. Um, now, for this week, what I thought would be good is to look at the origins of Merville's Choirs. Um, so this is the history of Merville's Choirs, part one. Now, I don't want to worry you, but I, um, in my uh, sort of investigation into the origins of Merville's Choirs, I was really quite surprised how far I could go back. And I have gone back to 58,000 BC. Now, you're probably thinking, well, surely to goodness, Mark, you're not going to sit through 60,000 years of uh, music history. No, because what I've done is I've given the big boy a limit and I've said to him, no more than 10 minutes. So he's going to try and go through 60,000 years of the growth of male voice choirs in 10 minutes so it remains to be seen so without further ado i'm going to hand you over to the big boy and we're going to be looking at the origins of male voice choir singing okay so here we go 58,000 bc is the date of the earliest ever discovered human hyoid bone the hyoid bone sits on top of the larynx and enables speech and singing. And so probably about 58,000 BC, there's some kind of noise like singing being made by humans. It takes another 10,000 years to 40,000 BC before there's a human made instrument. And that's the Paleolithic bone flute made of ivory and bone, probably made to sort of imitate the sound of humans singing, which advanced a bit by this point. 18,000 BC, the origins of the San people, humankind's oldest traditional community who live on the outskirts of the Kalahari Desert in Botswana and Namibia in South Africa. They have a beautiful singing tradition in the community which is complicated and polyphonic and probably dates back many, many, many thousands of years. Eight thousand BC is the date of the first ever examples of a lithophone. Okay, stop the clock just for one minute. I want to talk about a lithophone uh, and what a lithophone is, uh, and I want to use the example of Stonehenge. Now, we know that the rocks of Stonehenge were carried from over two hundred miles away, but we've never known why. Now. Researchers say that they believe it was for the special sonic qualities of a particular kind of stone and that Stonehenge might have served as a bell-like instrument. So, these stones are known as lithophones or rocks that produce notes when struck and they've been used that way in Wales for a long, long time. In fact, one Welsh village called Mine Clockock, translated roughly stone bells, even used blue stones as church bells until the 1700s. According to archaeologists, the Neolithic worshippers at Stonehenge may have turned to the Welsh to import their own version of rock music. Last summer, a team of archaeologists were allowed to give Stonehenge a bit of a try by striking them with rounded quartz hammerstones to see if this theory held water. They weren't optimistic since some of the stones had been stabilised by concrete but lo and behold, to the researcher's surprise, 
having tested all the blue stones at the monument, several were found to make distinctive, if muted, sounds. This was a sure indication that they would have been fully lithophonic if they'd had sufficient resonance space. Furthermore, a number of blue stones at Stonehenge show evidence of them having been struck. It's an absolute incredible discovery. Could our ancient ancestors actually communicate with each other in ways that we consider purely modern? And what was it like to be at Stonehenge when the bells actually rang out? Two thousand BC, one of the first ever examples of something like musical notation is discovered on tablets in ancient Mesopotamia in a village called Nibbard. They are instructions on how to make certain sounds, and so those tablets constitute something like the first ever composed melody. Now, by 500 BC, the Torah has come together as the scripture for the Jewish church. The Torah contains lots of descriptions of hymns, singing, and the Psalms of David, and so clearly in the early, early Jewish church, there was some sort of singing going on. That's also shown in 1st century AD. Jesus is alive and in Matthew's Gospel there are descriptions of Jesus and his disciples singing hymns together as part of their worship. Now, in the early Christian church, around 400, St. Augustine of Hippo says, He who sings prays twice. So clearly, it was an encouraged thing in the early Christian church too. And around a hundred years later in Spain, in Toledo, there are chronicles which described there being specific chant melodies sung in church for specific occasions that clearly choirs were singing in some sort of organized way around 500 AD. We But it takes another 400 years before this is written down. 900 AD in northern Spain, in Lyon, there exists Manuscript 8. That's one of the first existing examples of that chant melody tradition being written down, so it can be communicated in a literal fashion between different people, which is a big step for choirs and choral singing. Oh, In Paris, in France, in around 1150 through to around 1200, there's a huge development of singing, particularly in notated singing, because Léonin and Perrotin, musicians from Notre Dame, start compiling compositions in two, three or four parts, which can be sung by groups of people. This establishes around 1198, with Perrotin's Vedorant Omnes, the four-part format which exists roughly to this day as a sort of SATB in some sort of fashion.
Around 1200 to 1500, Europe is dominated by the Catholic Church and so is the traditional choral singing. And so inside the church, there's a huge flourishing of choirs and of sacred music. In 1441, for example, the King of England establishes King's College, Cambridge, together with a choir of men and boys that have continued singing the daily services right through until today. What an incredible tradition that is. Now, in 1517, as a huge challenge to the Catholic Church's power in the form of Martin Luther, divides the church in two ways into catholic and protestant that movement also divides music the catholics have an incredible tradition which continues through victoria palestrina bird lassus But in the Protestant church, there's also an incredible development for congregation and amateur singers. The chorales written by Luther and eventually by Bach In the 1600s, there are composers like Henry Purcell, who, as well composing for chapels and courts and cathedrals, also composed for people down the pub. And there's lots of beautiful and funny catches and rounds and ditties composed by Purcell for just that purpose, alongside a good pint of ale. And here we see the beginnings of male voice choirs. Julia tried the scornful puss has oft denied and sons and sins I can no I better better thrive a scornful puss has so kiss my kiss my kiss my kiss my kiss my my so kiss my arms, so kiss my arms, so kiss my arms, so kiss my arms, good clang, good clang, it is my so kiss my so kiss my so kiss my I'm 